Thank you. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining me and thank you, thank you for uh, inviting me along to speak to you tonight. And um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's get going with this. There we go. So hopefully you can see the first slide. Got a frog, perfect. Yeah. I always like to make sure you can see that to start with before I get like part way through and realize no one can actually see my presentation. <laughs> um, so as uh, yeah, Anthony very kindly kind of introduced me, um, yeah, I am actually a scientist by training. My background is in zoology with marine biology and wildlife biology and conservation. And Photography for me has always been a love from, you know, when my parents bought me my first camera when I was a little girl, right the way through to now. And I'm kind of, I am a professional photographer, but it is only a fraction of what I do. So if anyone asks me what I do, I am a wildlife researcher and photographer. So the scientist bit comes first. Um, not only that, but I'm actually an artist, a speaker, a judge, and, and numerous other things. There's a lot of strings to my bow when it, it comes to this. It's not just one thing. So I have actually been an ambassador for Manfrotto now for over 10 years, and I do quite a bit of macro stuff with them. I've also been lucky enough to be a guest judge on the British Wildlife Photographic Awards for two years. Uh, I've been on the judging panel for Bird Photographer of the Year for three years, and I'm a judge for a, a brand new competition called Wild Art Photographer of the Year, and that's about celebrating um, the more creative and artistic side of photography, images that wouldn't necessarily get awarded in other competitions. I'm also a co-host on something called the UK Wildlife Podcast. And this is something uh, myself and my best friend Neil started oh, back in October, November time, 2019. And we, we've continued it, it going. I have taken a little bit of a step back at the moment, but that's only a temporary thing. But we cover all kinds of, of wildlife, um, from birds and mammals and vertebrates to plants. We have special guests that come on to discuss various topics. And we also have our regular sightings. So I actually share my sightings from Free, which is where I live, and Neil shares his from Essex, where he lives. Um, so it, it's kind of a great way to kind of bring it all, all together. Now, if anyone's on social media, you can actually, um, my, my handles are there, so you can, you can always follow those uh, and see what I'm up to. But on to this evening, and I thought I'd talk to you about garden photography. Now, it's not just about garden photography, it's about how we can create those spaces and actually make our gardens better for wildlife as, as well. And it doesn't matter how big or small your garden actually is. So I'm actually gonna start off with images from my own garden. So this is my garden here in Fru. Um, the top left, so the picture just at the top here, this is actually what our garden looked like when we first moved into the house. It was grass and decking, and that was it, and it was devoid of any life. We never saw any invertebrates or anything, uh, maybe the odd ants, that was about it, as you can see, just nothing there. Within probably, you know, first few months of moving in, we'd actually started, uh, we built a little pond, a wildflower patch, put some pallet gardens at the back. Um, but then we, we did redo the decking to actually strip it down and restained it, but um, it actually wasn't very good quality decking and it, it was rotting away, sadly. But what we actually decided to do in lockdown last year, so we, we started in April, um, we decided we're just going to rip the decking up. Uh, so the next picture you can actually see is what it looked like once we've removed all the decking. You just kind of see the pond here and where I've started to create different areas um, and the pallet gardens up with like little mini beast hotels basically underneath them and then you can actually see how it's progressed so these bottom three pictures are all taken this year so I have a little alpine garden that is um, full of stone crops and different alpine um, plants a couple of ferns they're tucked away in the corner because that is one of the only places in our garden that we actually get shade in the summer so to give you an idea, our garden um, in the summer, it is hot and it is dry and it's exposed and it can hit 36, 37 degrees in our back garden. So we needed stuff that would actually be able to cope with that. But I really wanted to have a wild garden, something that was really easy to maintain, that had loads of areas for invertebrates. 
So where we actually remove the decking, we put big slate chippings down. And this is actually fantastic. Uh, 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 so many invertebrates and stuff that live um, and hide in amongst the slate chippings. It, it's fantastic. And then the rest of the area has really been sown to wildflowers. So you can actually see the wildflower strip really coming into its own with the red campion, kidney vetch. I'll talk a little bit more about the kidney vetch vetch and why that is so important in my garden a little bit later. Oxide daisies, which if you have oxide daisies in your garden or you know of areas, you know how quickly they spread. And then this is kind of the like downward view on the garden. So see I've got some turtle stepping stones, I actually made all these myself. And you can see all the wild patches and how it's really changed from when we first moved in. And by doing this, what it's meant is that our garden is now full of life. I have five species of spider. I have several species of butterfly. Normally, butterflies were a little bit late this year. Uh, I normally have crickets, grasshoppers, wood lice, um, all manner of things in the garden now, including frogs and toads. And the frogs actually breed in my pond as well. So it's absolutely fantastic. And whereas my garden really is about the smaller things, it's about the invertebrates and the amphibians. I do also get a lot of birds that come in and so a, a lot of the stuff that's planted that you might be able to just make out these kind of big two bushy plants here. These are actually knapweed and it's what I refer to as monster knapweed because it is absolutely huge. Amazing nectar rich plant, you know, absolutely incredible. It's covered in invertebrates. Mine doesn't actually flower until kind of July, August, late July, August time. But when it's finished flowering, I, I leave the seed heads on there because then it gets full of goldfinches and I can have up to eight to 10 goldfinches on the, on the knapweed as well. So there's that natural seed there um, for the birds. And by having the birds coming in the garden and they're attracted by the natural feed, I don't actually feed the birds. They actually eat some of the invertebrates as well that tend to take a liking to my strawberries, which, you know, I don't mind what they eat, but they're not allowed to eat my strawberries. That, that's, that's the golden rule in my garden. So let's have a look at some, some pictures taken um, in gardens. Now, most of these are actually taken in my garden, but a few of them are taken in my parents' garden as well. And I actually manage their garden, manage. Um, I go over and do quite a lot of work in their garden to help it. Um, we're trying to convert it to a more wildlife friendly garden. So I do spend quite a bit of time over there, which means I can also do quite a bit of photography over there as well. And these are snowdrops that we don't ever remember planting these snowdrops in the garden, but they appeared. And just one morning we had a slight dusting of snow and then the sunrise coming up through the hedge behind just produced this beautiful scene. And the one thing I love about garden photography is you can take your time and do you know what? You can go out in your pajamas with a cup of tea if you want. You don't have to get dressed. You don't have to drive anywhere. You can, you know, really just go to town and, and spend whatever time you want in the garden. And you can keep revisiting it time and time again. Now, for anyone um, that's interested in, in the photographic side of things, I'm not actually going to talk about um, the technical details, but they're there for anyone that is interested. I'm going to talk more about the plants um, or the subjects and the photography. So this year we actually split the snowdrops as well because we're aiming to have a really nice carpet of snowdrops. Great photographic subject, but they're also really super important for our early emerging bumblebees because they can be one of the sole sources of food for our, our early emerging bumblebees. And only has to reach about eight to 10 degrees on a sunny day and the snowdrops will open providing that food source. So actually snowdrops are a fantastic plant to have in your garden because not only do they provide that really kind of happy coming back to life after winter, but they're really important to our invertebrates as well. I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna hold my hand up here and say I'm not the biggest fan of daffodils. Um, I love wild daffodils, but the cultivated ones, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, I, I'm not the biggest fan, but my parents have these absolutely beautiful white ones that have this very subtle yellow trumpet to them. And those ones I do absolutely love. Um, it turns out that badgers apparently absolutely love these as well. And sadly badgers, managed to dig up most of the daffodil bulbs. 
Uh, but they are a lovely plant to have. And, and again, it's another really kind of a good nectar source um, for our invertebrates. And you can make some really beautiful images out of it. I mean, this is taken against the sky, a little bit of extra lighting into the flower just to really bring it out. And just all these lovely kind of textures and, and patterns on the petals and the crimpling around the trumpet. Um, just a really, really beautiful flower, this one. I mean, I'm not a big fan of the pure yellow ones, but this white one, I, I'm quite taken by, I have to admit. Now, something that I actually put in my garden this year, one, I have a couple of favourite wildflowers, uh, British native wildflowers. One of those is, is the past flower. I don't actually have any site that close to me where, where we have them growing wild. Um, the closest is probably Gloucestershire. It is only about an hour away, to be fair, so it's not that far. Um, but I absolutely love pasque flowers. I think they're stunningly beautiful. And I made the decision when we were redoing the garden last year that I actually wanted to try and grow pasque flowers in my garden um, because they're, they're a beautiful addition. And the bees absolutely love them this year. The, bit, the bumblebees went crazy for them. Now, this is actually one of our native species. This is our native species of um, past flower. I was actually managed, able, managed, was actually able to source um, a wild, uh, not a wild, sorry, a, a native uh, version of this past flower to grow in my garden. And it's done really well. And this is actually just photographed with my phone. Uh, so, you know, no fancy equipment or anything, just my phone uh, in the garden. And I've actually collected the seeds from it this year. So I'm, I'm gonna try and see if I can grow some more of them from seeds and basically have a lovely past flower meadow-ish area to the garden. Because I mean, again, these flower around about Easter time. Uh, it's where their the name comes from, past from, from, from it, kind of the Easter origins. So they've, again, it's another early flowering plant along with the snakes have fertility, which I also grow in the garden, but in the wetter part of the garden. And these are really, really important um, plants for, again, our like, earlier emerging invertebrates. And they do add a lovely splash of colour. And I mean, to be honest, this, this one did really well this year. And I think it, it will have, it seems to be happy where it is. I'm, I have a bit of a funny soil type here. Part of it is kind of chalk grassland and, and the back garden. Parts of it are basically builders rubbish that they just chucked in the garden and then threw the decking over the top. So. It's a bit of a weird combination, but I, I'm kind of finding what grows and what doesn't. So somebody did tell me what this plant was and I've completely forgotten and my mind has gone blank, uh, but it is a really beautiful flower, uh, photographed in my parents' garden, this one isn't actually in mine, and it's growing in amongst some bluebells. So what I've actually done is I've used those bluebells in the background as, you know, basically, Kind of to give a, a painted feel to the back of my picture really bringing these beautiful white flowers um to life like somebody did tell me what they were but I, I can't remember so if there's any botanists out there that can enlighten me it is not wild garlic um it's something else and i will know as soon as somebody mentions it so if you do know please put me out of my misery but some of these plants have, have popped up from nowhere and I've actually had the same in my front garden, and I'm going to talk about that because I have a very special plant growing in my front garden. And, and this has popped up. This wasn't planted. Things just seem to be popping up. So probably spread by birds, possibly cats as well from, from other people's garden. It is a cultivated plant, this one. It's not a wild plant. But again, I think if you're going to create, you know, a nice kind of wildlife friendly garden, I think actually you can have that nice mix of cultivated and wild plants that can grow really well together. The one thing I would say though is please, please, please do not plant Spanish bluebells. Um, if you want to put bluebells in your garden, it is now really easy to source um, responsibly grown native British bluebells. Um, and they're much better to have in the garden um, because Spanish bluebells are hybridizing with our, our native ones and we're losing quite a few areas of native bluebells now as a result that they're, they're actually the hybrids are taking over and I actually have native bluebells in my garden they are super easy uh, to come by so this one's actually taken uh with just the other week actually when we had that really sunny weather before something went wrong and we got lots of cloud and, and it wasn't so nice before the heavy rain 
I actually bought a wildflower seed mix um, from, I think it's like the British Wildflower Seed Meadow Company. And I got a mix that was specific to the area in which I live. Um, so I know that around this particular area, I know what plants generally you can find out in, in the meadows. Uh, and I wanted that mix. And it's not just about wildflowers. Uh, a lot of people, when they, when they want to maybe rewild part of their garden or plant some stuff, they just do wildflowers. It's actually really, really important to have the grasses as well. They are just as an important part of a, a meadow or a wild patch as the wildflowers are, because we have a lot of species that actually depend on the grasses. And by having that nice mix of flowers and grasses, if you're into your photography, they actually provide a really nice kind of backdrop or you know framing um, to photograph in some of the plants. But you know, I get both grasshoppers and crickets. I get dark green bush cricket and spectral bush cricket in my garden. I also get a couple of species of grasshopper as well. And they do need those grasses. Uh, so it, it's actually really nice to have that mix and it is really important um, as well. This flower is, is red campion. Done extraordinarily well in my garden this year. Um, I've never seen red campion as high as this other than on Skoma Island. It has taken over, but it's quite an early one. It's actually finished flowering now, so it's done. It flowers in May. Um, it, it's got a few flowers hanging on like this one that was taken last week, but most of them actually flower kind of May time. And now it's going over, and what I'm actually doing is as it's going over, I'm collecting some of those seeds to actually then, uh, when I do my front garden again this year, I will put some of them in, in the front garden. And you can actually see the kidney vetch here which again seems to be monster kidney vetch in my garden. Uh, and when that goes to seed, I will also collect some of the seeds. So it's basically, I can keep that going, I can keep that turnover of plants going, which is really important um, for bringing kind of the invertebrates in. Now, something that I wanted to plant in my garden because I absolutely love nigella. I love the colors and the textures. I think they're just the most beautiful flower with the most beautiful seed heads. So, I did buy an additional pack of my jello seeds to sow. I wasn't expecting them to be in flower in January. So these were actually taken on a frosty morning in January. Nice soft light, um, really kind of highlighting the, the crystals on the flower. And I actually think it looks like one of those sugar flowers you get in a restaurant sometimes with your desserts or, or whatever, you know, or, or maybe on a cake or something. And that's what it reminds me of. But this is taken in January. Now, Someone said to me, oh, if you plant nigella, just be really careful because they spread like wildfire. I have a grand total of zero nigella plants in my back garden this year. Not one of them has come up, but I have got them come up in the front. And I actually took the seed from the back and sowed them in the front um, this year. Not all of them, just some of them. But I haven't had anything come up in the back, uh, which is, is quite interesting. But I think they're actually a really lovely addition to have and and I, I love a garden with lots of textures and colors but I like it to be kind of wild and inviting if that makes sense as well I, I can't I don't like straight borders and lines I like everything to kind of flow over each other and, and just it, it does look after itself as well which, which is a bonus but I love that everything kind of combines into everything else so moving on to something that is a little bit special. So I've still got these other plants and wildflowers and that that are growing in the garden that I've put in there. But last year I had a real surprise and I was just checking things over in March time before I um, sowed some more wildflower seeds. And I couldn't believe my eyes when I found a couple of bee orchid rosettes. March is actually a really good time to look for the rosettes because the grass is still really small. Uh, really, really short, so you can actually see the rosettes relatively easily um, in amongst the grass. And I actually had three um, in there, only one flower, which isn't really a surprise. The other two are very small. Uh, one of those other ones has actually flowered this year, so I do have a bee orchid again in my garden this year. But the one thing I thought this would give me an opportunity, so this was last year when we were still in lockdown. And although I have photographed bee orchids in the wild, and this is a wild one, I didn't plant this. This appeared in my garden last year. I had absolutely no idea it was there until I found the rosette. And I didn't honestly think it would flower. But one thing I thought this would give me the chance to do was actually follow this, the flowering journey and document the flowering journey of 
one plant, something that I've never been able to do in the wild because I'm normally away or I'm traveling or, you know, I, I can't visit the same site, you know, that many times to actually document every single time a flower comes out. And I've been up at a site today and, and sadly a lot of the bee orchids have either been trampled or eaten and we actually only found a couple. So when one appeared in my front garden, I thought, well, this is actually perfect because it's protected. No one else knows it's there apart from me. Um, and, you know, it, it gets the shade through the hottest part of the day because the front of our garden actually gets, the front garden gets the sun in the morning. And then by the time it goes round, it's actually in shade. So it's actually protected from the heat of the day. And it did allow me to capture this and actually, this particular plant had 10 flowers on it and I've never seen a bee orchid with that many flowers and in that good condition as well. So this, I basically set myself a mini project to use the same camera and lens to go out and photograph it in different lighting conditions, different time of day, and just document that, that flowering journey. So I'm actually gonna show you now um, all 10 flowers. So we start at one and you can see how the plant grows as, different you know as, as more flowers actually open and you can actually see how big it gets in the end I mean I've never seen a bee orchid this tall not only the bee orchid though you can actually see how everything else has grown up around it so it got more challenging um, as the weeks went by to photograph it um, but it was really good fun to do and from a scientist's point of view it was really fascinating to see how each flower opens and develops and how the colors change um, as the plant matured and, and the other flowers opened. I mean, the, the last flower to open, flower 10, right up at the top, was nowhere near as vibrant in colour as the first couple of flowers. So it, it was really interesting to see, see that journey as a scientist and then to be able to document it as a photographer. Now, I, I'd like to say I take part in No Mo May. Um, I'm a big advocate for it, but I think, you know, you need to be careful with it. Um, I take part in no mow year, so I don't just do a month. I trim everything early springtime before anything really starts to come up. It gets a haircut, and then my my grasses get cut. My wildflower patches get cut again in the autumn, and that's it. They get two cuts a year, and they're thriving. They really are. I've got another bee orchid in my front garden. I've got a common spotted in my front garden. I save a common spotted from my neighbor's garden uh, which I actually transplanted into my back garden that has not only survived but it is now flowering and looking beautiful um you know and I, I just leave nature to do its thing and by doing that I just have you know this amazing array of, array of species I get I've got a good couple of ants nests out the front as well so you know when we get those nice that warm humid day where the air is exactly right the humidity is right the wind conditions are right i get flying ant day right outside the front of my house i appreciate this is probably not everyone's you know excitement time but i get so excited i love watching the natural flights of flying ants it is phenomenal to watch and watching them all erupt from the earth and i can just watch that outside the front garden which is amazing so let's move away from plants and let's talk about invertebrates because by having this huge variety of plants, and I have a couple of bee hotels as well, um, I actually now have a huge variety of invertebrates in my garden that I didn't have when we first moved in. Now we've been in this house about six or seven years, and you know it's really starting to come to life and come into its own now. So it does take time to do. I'm not 100% on this bee species, but this is uh, one of the solitary bees that I actually found sleeping. This is taken quite late on in the last kind of last little bits of, of daylight. We actually get the sun setting out out the back of the house. So there's last little bits of kind of golden daylight, just bringing out all the details in the hairs and everything. Sadly, what I didn't realize when I actually took this photograph, I thought this bee was sleeping on the fence post. Um, it wasn't until I went out the next morning that realized it was still there. And I thought, okay, well, maybe it's still sleeping. It was still there the following evening. Um, sadly, it was actually dead, but I didn't realize, and, and it hadn't been there the whole of the day, you know, that previous day when I photographed it. So whether it kind of demised, it might have demised after I photographed it, but, you know, it, it's still lovely to kind of see them there. 
Um, probably one that's already laid her eggs and, and blocked up the tubes in the bee hotel, uh, to be honest. Now, the one thing that I am a big advocate for is ponds. Um, I don't have a big garden, you've seen from the pictures, it's not a huge garden. My pond is about a metre by a metre and then probably not quite a metre deep. It's only a small pond, but ponds are amazing for attracting all kinds of wildlife. I've had damselflies, dragonflies, I had a, um, a beautiful demoiselle in the garden the other week. And I get a lot of hoverflies that actually come and, and sit um, at the pond as well. And this is uh, one of the flies that would come quite regularly at this time of year and just sit on the leaves around the pond or, or hovering over the pond. And the pond actually makes quite a nice background as well. So that's actually my background here. And it's allowed me just to photograph um, this fly. And I love the way its, it's little feet are kind of sticking up. And they're absolutely fascinating. I think the, the more time you spend, you know, looking at, at the different invertebrates and, and those that maybe aren't as popular. So, you know, away from the butterflies and the bees and everything, you know, you've got the flies, you've got the beetles and, and all of that. There's so many fascinating invertebrates there that you can attract into, into your garden. Now, these are actually, I've got a few here that were taken this year. This is a cinnabar moth. Um, I have ragwort that has appeared in my garden. It wasn't planted, I didn't put it there. But I know that it's a real favourite for the cinnabar and they lay their eggs on it and then the caterpillars absolutely love munching it. So I've left it. You know, I, I've left ragwort in my garden. I've got a couple of, I've got one kind of big stand of it, um, the relatively big stand in the size of the garden. And these plants are huge this year. So, so they are pushing probably four and a half foot, some of these plants. But, you know, when you get these beautiful stunning moths coming into your garden and, and laying their eggs on it and then their caterpillars are going to munch it. And I think it's well worth keeping it there. There's a few that I might remove from, from different areas. Um, but you know, the cinnabar moth caterpillars are absolutely stunning as well. So anything like this, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna leave it and, and see what see what happens. And it's me, I've had cinnabar moths in, in the garden now for a couple of years, um, you know, or, or kind of flying by, but it is good to actually kind of see them coming in and using the garden more regularly now. And hopefully that will build up as the years go on. Another regular visitor that I find, particularly to my um, oxide daisies, is the thick-legged flower beetle, also known as the false oil beetle. Um, probably see from that lovely kind of sheen on it. Doesn't really look anything like an oil beetle to me, so I, I'm going to go with thick-legged flower beetle. But these are this lovely metallic emerald green colour, and they really are absolutely beautiful, especially when you see them on the oxide daisies. So I've got quite a few of these in the garden. They seem to absolutely love, love the daisies. And if you've got oxide daisies, it's a really good idea to have a look on the underside as well, because you get quite often crab spiders will hide on the underside of the daisies and they'll lurk there in waiting because they're ambush predators. I, I haven't found any yet this year, but it's been pretty cold and miserable here today. So hopefully as the summer goes on, we'll start to find a few more uh, pop up. So this is actually one of my species of spider that I have in the garden. This is a zebra jumping spider. I have quite a lot of these. They love the sunny walls of the house and the fences. And it's great watching them. I, mean, I sat out one afternoon having a cup of tea, watching this little spider, and that actually caught a fly and was just happily, you know, injecting venom and, and doing what spiders do to flies on the wall, you know, above where I was having a cup of tea. And it is amazing to watch these little battles play out. And then have that opportunity to photograph them as well. Yeah, there's so much that goes on. And I love watching jumping spiders because I think they're cute. I, I actually do genuinely think that jumping spiders are super cute. They have those two big eyes and they're really kind of hairy as well, which I think helps with it. And if you actually sit and watch a, a jumping spider, it will actually watch you. You can see it kind of move its, its head um, to kind of suss you out a little bit as well. And, I think they're great fun to have in the garden uh, and depending on where you live and you know you might get um, the fence fence post jumping spider as well we have a few species uh, but I think the zebra ones are my favorite because they just have um, great colors I actually get quite a lot of young um, zebra spider zebra jumping spider spiderlings that actually appear in my house later on in the year as well and spiders generally are welcome in the house 
got a few cellar spiders, if they poo everywhere, make a mess, um, they're not so welcome in my house. This is another common garden visitor. This is actually the garden cross spider. This is a female. Um, we can tell because of the size, the males are much, much smaller. They're really weeny and they don't have a big abdomen. October is a great time to find these. You start to see them probably August and then they really start to come into their own as they get big when they start appearing and, and their big webs, their dew covered webs appear in October. Um, we actually name our spiders in the garden, particularly the big ones. So we had two, the year that I shot this, we actually had two. This one's coffee and the other one was called tea. Um, probably guess by the colours why. This one's much more kind of almost like kind of dark, really kind of dark or, or black coffee coloured. And the other one was very much more like a tea coloured. So we called them tea and coffee. Um, yeah, there's some interesting stuff out there. If you have a phobia of spiders, if you name them, apparently it helps. Uh, but there you go. And this is just taken kind of looking through the web a bit. So they will consume their web and actually re spin it anew in a slightly different position every single day. So it gives you scope for actually doing lots of different kind of ideas in photography um, when it comes to them. And just watching them sometimes. I mean, watching a spider spin a web is, is incredible. It's like a work of art. So this is, I said I'd talk a little bit more about the kidney vetch, why I have it in the garden. This is not actually on kidney vetch at the moment, but for the last two years, I've had small blue butterflies visit my garden. And I spoke to somebody at Butterfly Conservation in Somerset uh, last year when I actually had a mating parent in my front garden. And to the best of their knowledge, it's the first ever recording of small blue, blue butterflies in Froome and certainly in a garden in Froome. Um, so it's like a really kind of big deal. This is, this is, you know, it's not a butterfly that is easy to see. It's quite a rare butterfly with quite a restricted distribution because their sole larval food plant is kidney vetch. So when I had these in the garden last year, I thought that's it. I'm, you know, I'm going to make sure that I plant kidney vetch. And it's really paid off because I've had them come back this year. So this was actually taken um, last week. Uh, I've got a few more uh, in the series. I've actually got one on kidney vetch in amongst the red campion so you get a nice kind of mix of pink and yellow. But it's amazing to have the, this beautiful small butterfly visit the garden and spend so much time in the garden as well. Um, so I'm hoping that if I can keep the kidney vetch going and you know grow the pockets of it, I'm also going to plant some in the front garden next year. It will actually really, really help kind of produce little corridors as well because small blue butterflies won't travel far from swathes of kidney vetch. Um, so there must be another one around here somewhere. But I thought, you know, if I can plant some more, then it actually helps create that little wildlife corridor. And the more we can do in our gardens, we can actually, I mean, even if you only have a pot with wildflowers in, it's a little kind of jumping spot. It, it's like a feeding station for these invertebrates to move on to other areas. So we can actually you know, create these little wildlife corridors for our invertebrates just by doing a little bit of work in our garden. And this, this is by far my most exciting and best visitor to my garden. And that's saying a lot because I love my frogs, but this definitely trumps the frogs. So I, I did mention earlier that I do get um, crickets in the garden. This is actually a dark bush cricket nymph, teeny little thing hiding in amongst the Yorkside daisies here. I love them. I think they're full of personality. They're really sweet, really cute, and really fun photographic subjects as well. If you get them, you know, at the right time of day when they're kind of just sitting there poking their heads around the flowers, they're so much fun to just sit and watch. And I will quite often sit in my garden now and just watch everything come and go and, and watch them behaving and seeing what they do. And um, I mean, this was taken a couple of years ago now. Um, you know, and just having you know, having these little guys in the garden is just absolutely wonderful. And, and that's one of the reasons it's really driven me to actually make more of my garden. So, you know, my garden is very much about the invertebrates and the wildlife, but I've done it in such a way that it actually enables me to photograph it as well. So it is almost like a living photographic studio outside that's completely natural. And I've done that just by leaving spaces between the different areas that I can sit without crushing anything, you know, or I can, you know, shoot through, I've got little patches that I can put camp, my camera down. 
and that's just by careful planning you know putting everything you know around where, where i need it to be so i have to finish with a couple of frogs because i love frogs they are my absolute pride and joy and this is a little frog look from a couple of years ago sadly not from my garden this is actually from my parents garden we have a big pond there and i actually we had a big problem five years of no frogs born no frogs i said right i, I need to revamp the pond i need to redo it did a lot of work with the pond and lo and behold the following year the frogs actually bred we had you know not a huge amount of spawn um but then we had the first little froglets emerge um for you know five or six years and it was just an absolute joy to watch them at the edge of the pond in amongst um the foliage just you know doing what little froglets do eating and sitting there in the shade trying not to be eaten um and i love them i think they're so cute and adorable and such a great addition to the garden as well because they are natural pest controllers um so it's absolutely they are you know great to have in there they eat the slugs and the snails that eat our, our strawberries and stuff so you know always welcome in the garden and this was the other success story of my parents garden because we actually have toads that breed in um in the main pond of my parents uh it's very unusual to get toads breeding in a garden pond but this is one of the few places that they actually have left now to breed because so many people in the area have building their ponds, um, building work with new housing estates going up, but there's nowhere for these guys to go. So what we're trying to do at my parents' house is basically create an oasis for this wildlife to go. And, and again, you know, I've been quite savvy where I put everything in that there's places for me to sit and to be able to photograph and document this wildlife as well, you know, just as it's going about its life and, and what it does. And, and this is actually a one of the first little toadlets that's ever emerged from, the, from a garden pond um, at my parents and sitting in a little leaf at the edge of the pond looking too adorably cute for its own good. And I did have to put in a bird picture. Um, I don't do that much bird photography, it has to be said, but last year during um, the hot weather, we actually have a couple of bird baths out and i just sat there one afternoon and thought well it'd be quite fun to see if i could see you know photograph the starlings bathing in in the bird bar i had a total of i think the most we ever had in there was eight how eight starlings got in that bird bath i do not know um yeah yeah quite surprising really um but as you can see all this bird bath is is a tray on a plant pot it's nothing fancy, it's nothing expensive. I do have another little um, bird bath, a uh, stone one next to the pond that the smaller birds tend to use. This is the one that the bigger birds, so the starlings, the magpies and that, I tend to use. But I just thought it was amazing the way that they're just essentially emptying the bird bath. So I would have to fill the bird bath a couple of times a day. But actually their action of doing this, you can see all the spray there, was actually watering all the plants around it so where i've got the bird bath now i have a lot of my snakes have fertility and my water loving plants are actually surrounding that bird bath because when the birds bathe in it they're kicking out the water all the time it's kind of giving me that natural wetland area around the bird bath which is great and is vital for these birds as well they, they do need the water to drink and to keep their feathers clean so i thought i'd put in a picture of some starlings spraying water everywhere and, and having a bird bath um uh, just to finish off so i hope you kind of find that interesting and like i said that is all garden photography that's garden wildlife and that's me gardening for wildlife so seeing what comes into the garden and seeing what i can do to help improve my garden for those species that i know are coming into it and it really really does pay off it is so incredibly rewarding you know quite often now on a nice day I will just sit in the garden in the afternoon with a cup of tea and just watch everything um, coming and going. Um, so I hope you have found it interesting and, and enjoyed the pictures as well. Um, part of this, this that I'm doing with, um, with my garden, with my parents' garden, and I'm helping a lot of other people with their gardens and giving them ideas of what they can do to help wildlife, how we can create new wildlife corridors um, for the invertebrates, because a lot of stuff focuses on wildlife corridors for birds and mammals but not so much for our invertebrates and, and also our wildflowers as well they need to be able to spread and, and have areas uh, to grow and, and survive 
this is all part of an ongoing long-term project I have um, called Forgotten Little Creatures. And I started this years ago. Um, I actually published my first ever book, which is uh, this one here. Um, and everything in this book is actually taken within 40 miles of my house in Frey. Most of it is actually within 30 miles. So it's local wildlife and it's plants, um, invertebrates, amphibians um, and reptiles at the back as well, got some lizards. But it's about bringing together science, um, historical facts um, and the photography and also little tips for, for what you can do. So if you want to see more about the book or interested in more about the project, if you actually pop onto my, my website, um, vixpick.com, there is actually a drop down menu there. Um, the project has its own kind of section and gallery. What I've also gone back to this year is um, photography for me is, is very limited right now. And actually, I won't be doing any photography pretty much now for the rest of the year um, due to a shoulder injury. So I've gone back to my drawing, but my drawing comes from my own photographs. And you can see some of the examples uh, there as well. And, and I'm really enjoying being back into that. And I'm actually now photographing. I, I did have a, one last trip out today and I was photographing wild orchids for the sole purpose of actually drawing them. So I'm photographing for my drawing now, um, which is interesting. And I, I will be doing some of the plants and that from my own garden. Uh, the bee orchid, that is actually the bee orchid from my front garden. You might kind of recognize that kind of shape of it. That is the one from, from my front garden there. So I hope you've all enjoyed it. I hope maybe it's given you a little bit of inspiration, maybe some ideas or anything that you might be able to carry on uh, into your own garden um, or photography as well. So I think the two go very, very well together. Um, but right now I'm going to open it up to any questions to see if anyone